I now would like to invite uh, Chris Dudick, um, the creator of, uh, he, Chris is an entrepreneur uh, from our, uh, uh, our own yard from, from New Jersey, and um, he initiated uh, collaboration with Rutgers with my lab to begin exploring the digitization of many of the tasks that he already has successfully uh, is successfully doing in, in the schools. And again, as with a lab and an app, which are also ongoing collaborations, what we're trying to do is understand the digital code, the digitization of this continuous stream of movement and how extract patterns from it so we can scale it because it has an element of uniqueness, personalized uh, interaction, and we need to discover what that is for each child. And so in the case of Chris, this is also going to, to serve as a, as a platform to, to offer data for many people to analyze along with my, my own lab. So Chris, teach us about your, your uh, Silas project. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, Chris Dudek. I'm a, uh, the CEO of Silas. Silas is a social emotional learning platform and behavior program. Uh, and our story started about 15 years ago. Um, I worked in television. I really loved the process of creating stories, working with the characters, writing these stories, working with the voice actors. Uh, I worked for, Nickelode uh, for um, shows that um, were produced on Nickelodeon. And I loved the process. I thought that kids could do it. I thought if you gave kids the, the means to produce and create, that they could actually create better things than adults. So I created a program, a business called Small Factory Productions. Uh, and we ended up having kids come and work in production pairs, uh, in groups. So we would create characters, we would write stories, we had a sound booth, we uh, recorded their voices, we cr created theme songs, we produced these amazing movies. We actually won an Emmy for one of the movies that we created. And um, over time, um, the program grew. We did video game design, music production, all different types of really STEAM-based activities. And th this was about 10 years before it was really happening in schools. So uh, we ended up really early on realizing that a lot of the students that were coming were special needs students. They were doing phenomenal things with the computer, but I was having issues with some of the behavior, some of the social skills within the classes. So I reached out to a speech language pathologist I knew, Dr. Bernadette Mullen, and I told her, I said, we've got these great kids, I'm having some issues, what do you think? And I'll never forget what she said. She was saying that she was using the same boring type of activities, paper-based data, worksheets. Uh, for the, it really hasn't changed in 40 years since it started. And she said, you're getting these kids and they're excited to be with you. Why don't we have you do your cool tech stuff and I'll do my, uh, and she'll do her, uh, integrate her social skills, the traditional social skills. And, and that's what we did. We had a technology-based social skills program that did very well over a long period of time. We basically organically grew Silas in that time. Uh, we ended up getting uh, a beta version of Silas. We then ended up uh, working with Princeton and Kane University. We did some studies that showed really good uh, progress. And um, we then pitched the National Science Foundation. And in 2017, we developed the Silas platform uh, that um, we're working on today. Uh, so with that said, I think it's always best to come from the kids. This is uh, a video that the kids um, themselves are talking about the program. Not loaded. All right, so they say a lot of really great things about the program. Um, so what we're offering is, and I'll, I'll probably, it's actually not moving. There we go. All right, so what we're offering is the kids create their own animations. They use video game, um, the, the basics of video games, they're creating avatars. When they speak, the avatars speak. It's a lot of fun for them. Uh, we set up social situations where they practice. They, they're role playing in a safe, friendly, low risk virtual environment. And um, we ended up using video game controllers to start and we've since moved on to touchscreen devices and keyboards. So it, it, Minecraft and Fortnite, all these games that students play, they're able to do the same exact functions that they would during Silas. 
So Silas today is a four-step process. Uh, we work with schools. We offer a screening tool. Uh, so we're screening for social emotional deficits. A teaching tool, so we're teaching uh, and giving curriculum for the teachers. It's prepackaged, ready to go. They don't have to look for things. Uh, a create feature where they get to create these amazing movies. And then an assess uh, feature where they're able to um, store all of the data that they're collecting. Uh, and today we offer our video role play um, through the avatars. We have four different curriculum, social emotional learning, executive functioning, applied behavior analysis, and trend, transition voc. And um, currently we're working with over 40 school districts, 140 individual schools, and we're reaching more than 30,000 students through some parts of our program. So whether it's the screening, the tier one, which is for all students in social emotional learning, or um, our, our tier two, tier three, which the schools are more for the students that need the most support. Uh, and what we're connecting with for social emotional learning, every state has their standards. Social emotional learning is new. Although we've been doing it in social skills for special needs students for over 40 years, CASEL has basically developed a framework that applies to all students. And what they say, uh, they're basically the national standard, and our states are starting to follow them. Uh, they basically say that to be a well-rounded human, you have these five uh, competencies. You have uh, self-awareness self skills self-management skills, responsible decision-making skills, relationship skills, and social awareness skills. But all of these depend on motor control. So is it really for all students? Our screening um, offers uh, teacher screening. So teachers can screen their students. They're going to answer, answer a bunch of questions. And they'll get results on where they may start. Uh, we have a student screener. Students have to understand the questions in order to, understand, uh, you know, to, to put it in, uh, the, the results. Parents um, also can screen their students. And we collaborate all that data into one, um, one chart so that you can actually see where all stakeholders are, are saying, where they may start with the student or the group. We, we scale this so that it works with groups, with classrooms, with schools. And you can really start understanding the dynamics of what's happening socially. And then we provide our curriculum. Again, we have our, our tiered curriculum. So it's something for all students, something for your more challenged learners, ABA curriculum, executive functioning curriculum, and transition vocational curriculum. And I hope this plays. It does, I think. So this is a video uh, that was created by two uh, special needs students in Indiana. Uh, this is probably taken over about two week period. It's an activity, uh, multiple activities that support them learning in the classroom. This is on giving compliments and asking good questions. Wow, that is a really great t-shirt. Where can I buy one? I bought it at Target. It's, it was $12. Cool, what section? Is it 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, or 18? It's 21. OK, great. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye. So um, I love that movie because it really shows a lot. Um, first off, it's a low-risk virtual environment. The students are practicing skills like asking questions in a safe, friendly place. They can choose a number of different avatars, different settings. They can work with different peers. They wrote this social narrative. So um, they're talking about Target in here and all the aisles. They're building their social emotional learning and all the things they know in their lives into their, um, into their movies. So it's, it's relevant. It's giving them agency over the topics while they're practicing. Um, and you know, I can now ask the, the one boy, you know, Officer Dave asked a lot of questions there. Do you think maybe he could have just said, you know, um, what aisle is it in, you know? Or, so it's a, it's a safe, friendly environment. They're able to practice a number of times, which makes it not boring after one time. And it's them. It's not like a passive learning experience where you say, hey, watch this video. This is how you resolve a conflict. Or this is how you, you, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, make eye contact. We teach them. We use the curriculum to teach uh, the teachers so they can teach the students. And then the students then get uh, a chance to show them what they've learned. Uh, we've got a number of uh, research behind this. Uh, one of them was a 10-week study. Silas was done for 20 minutes, two days a week. And all competency levels rose for all students, um, not just special ed students. 
Also, there's a lot of research behind gamification. So making things fun, turning things into a game is really exciting for students. Um, so just a couple of them uh, here is uh, that computers increase engagement in learning for ASD students and that the use of gamification improves the experience even more. So like the basics of that is if I'm your teacher, I'm giving you a math problem to do. You're going to do it. But if I tell everybody, all right, we're going to do a math problem. The first 10 people that get it right, I'm going to give you $5. And then the first person that gets it right is going to get an extra five. Like it, it sparks some, some, some excitement, some, some gamification in it. So you can do this in all different ways. Um, my daughter's class is a general ed classroom. And they, uh, they have piggy banks where they're basically making money and working all day. Everything. And then they get to spend it in fun ways. You know, they get to get time off or do whatever. So it's gamifying and, and giving, giving, um, giving agency over, over the things that the students need to learn. And in our case, it looks like a game. It's practiced like a game. The kids are actually moving their avatars just like a game. So um, it's fun for them. And it's something that they know and, and understand. Also, that movie was 30 seconds. So it's not like they're sitting on technology for a long time. It's a quick hit. But all of that work is exciting. And they're doing it because they're going to have that opportunity to showcase and, and, um, and partake in that movie experience. But there's a new problem. And um, this is something that I think we might be one of the only social emotional companies to understand this. The key building blocks of social emotional learning are invisible to the naked eye. So we don't know what we don't know. Meaning that a lot of what happens during social interactions are invisible to the naked eye. So humans rely on observation of social and emotional phenomena. Observation relies on visual awareness and verbal cues. But most emotional and social phenomena occurs largely beneath awareness. So spontaneous gestural phenomena escapes the limits of the naked eye. So that is why we don't know what we don't know. Because it's hidden beneath our conscious recollection of what's happening, or what we're observing, or what we're giving our opinion on. And there's a lot of assumptions and misconceptions about social emotional learning and that students um, uh, may be able to follow instruction or if they're ready to follow instruction. So there's things that we see the students are doing and then there's what's happening inside. So the subjective opinion is that, and this is something that we're watching and seeing, the child's asocial. Child lacks empathy. The child is oppositional. Child is aggressive, he's a problem child, uh, ch problem child, he's doing it deliberately, he can control himself. But what the objective reality is, is that internally, the physiological state, he may be in pain. He, the child's nervous system could be dysregulated. Child's sensory motor code is altered. Child needs support, help, and assistance. And it's inevitable, the child cannot control himself. So how do we help the child gain control? And how do we help the teachers? We digitalize social emotional learning. So teachers are going to welcome additional eyes in the classroom. So our platform, our gamified platform, is going to enable social emotional learning that collects physiological data. And we're going to do this non-invasively. So think about uh, something that's commercially available. We can't put eye, eye watches on every single student. We have, we have districts that have 8,000 students. We can't have Fitbits. Um, things like that is going to be hard. It's not scalable. So we need commercial available means. Something that all students have and pretty much everybody in this room has is an iPhone. Students have one-to-one -one devices. They all have video cameras. So we're going to leverage the video cameras. As long as, long as a video camera has 30 seconds, uh, 30 frames per second, we'll be able to use it to uh, acquire data. And doing that is going to make it scalable. It's going to make it fully inclusive and diverse. Everybody has access to some sort of technology that has a camera in it today. Um, and it needs to be brief. If we're going to be doing it in the school, we can't say we're going to be doing this for an hour. We're going to take up this amount of time. There's no time. So we're going to have to do that. And it's going to have to be automated. So if it's automated, that means someone's not sitting in the back end trying to figure out what's happening. It's going to spit out reports, and it's going to be giving um, really great data for the, for the practitioners. So we're going to leverage tasks that are already happening in the classroom, like morning meetings. 
That's the place where kids, before the day starts, they're talking about how they're feeling, what they're doing. We can put games and things into it. And uh, we're going to be using classroom activities like responsive classroom. There's time that we can build this type of uh, um, activity um, in, or the screening tool into the day. So Silas is going to be fully uh, integrating with neuroscience. Um, we're going to be creating a basic neurological social emotional screener. We're going to be doing it through scalable research. We're going to be creating a scalable research platform, truly inclusive through diversification. We're going to be providing education and training. And we're going to be working with schools, homes, clinics. Um, and we're going to be targeting um, students with ASD, nonverbal language disorders, ADHD, and basic general special needs students. And we're doing this through a partnership with Rutgers University. So we're going to be launching Silas D, a med tech tool that's supporting the diagnosis and intervention of the needs of students with ASD. This is going to be the eyes in the classroom. And uh, this is a brief, fun, five-second acquisition um, that will happen. And this is an example of one part of it. Good job. All right. Next. Now you want to make a happy face. Oh, good. You're already smiling. Are you going to hit start? Go ahead. So the student is smiling into the camera where he's been prompted to make a smile. Good job. Uh, but this is what the whole, the whole app currently looks like. Um, we, ha we have a, a launching. There's a practice where the student has to fit his face into the circle. Uh, we have a resting phase where we're taking measurements. We have a happy face that they're going to be making, a surprise face, an angry face, and a sad face. All of these are five seconds. While this is happening, we're plotting 67 points on their faces that we're able to measure. And through five seconds and with these points, that's 30 seconds uh, per uh, 30 seconds uh, f frame, 30 seconds of frame, and times five seconds, which is 150 times the 67 points. It's a lot of data that we're able to use um, to to get some really meaningful, um, really meaningful data. So, this is a screening for social emotional attention states, and it's providing the teacher with an index of readiness for instruction. And this is some of the data that our, our uh, data collection that our app is going to be mimicking. So what's happening here is we're looking at eye gaze, face grid, and head orientation. This is based on prior research. So while our app is running, we're going to be using data collection that's been validated in computer science, machine learning, and AI. And this is what the data looks like when we get it. These are the biometrics that distinguish between happy and sad. They're neurologically based. And the face has been divided into three major components uh, based on the trigeminal nerve. So each region contributes differently to each emotion. We can automatically detect the emotions that are present or absent. And each point tells you a probability distribution uh, describing the predictive patterns of the region. So you can see happy and sad, within five seconds, we know they are totally different. They are totally different animals with totally different probability distributions. And our app is going to be able to understand and see that. This is based off of uh, our, our, the way we see happy and sad is, uh, is, is, uh, is based off of uh, prior research. Um, this is based off the universal uh, facial action units. And we're looking at things like the inner brow, the brow uh, lower, the upper lid raiser. Um, all of this is going to be something that we're going to be using to detect uh, the different emotions that are happening. So that's a little bit about where Silas D is today. Um, what I see in the future is um, collaborating with Rutgers University is Ideally, taking the app and including it into our current avatar uh, puppet system. So while the kids are naturally socializing through the computer, they'll be able to be physiologically assessed. The other thing is, um, think about coming to a classroom as a teacher. Students are on doing some of their do-nows, doing those morning meetings, doing some basic games. And while those games are happening on their one-to-one -one devices, we're able to collect physiological data. The data is pumped into a teacher uh, chart where they now see, I got to go talk to Joey. Something's going on today. 
you know, or, or this is what's happening with this suit, or my class is just not in the right space right now. Let's do something different. So this is all things that we can, we can find um, underneath, inside, and we're able to measure it today. So this is just the beginning, uh, and we're very excited for our future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. That was great.